Welcome to the Sui Generous Show, your unique perspective on everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. With Erica Merrill, I'm attorney Brian Jones, criminal defense and civil rights warrior. Today in segment one, we'll be discussing the success of Columbus's alternative response pilot program, a bill proposed in Texas. It's going to make it harder for nonprofits to assist indigent people who can't afford to get out of jail on bail. And the case of an Arizona deputy who was impersonating a lawyer in order to secure an arrest. During segment two, as promised, we'll be discussing your Sixth Amendment rights to a trial by jury. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Look to the law office of BrianJones.com and all of our social media outlets for everything you need to know about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. So Erica, did you see in the news this week that Columbus officials are praising the pilot program that uses social workers instead of police officers to respond to drug and mental health emergencies? Yeah, and I I know we had spoken about the need for this for so long. Before they even came up with this, you were talking about how, you know, it's really not a police officer's job to go out there and respond to mental health issues. And they don't know how to do it. And they shouldn't be expected to wear all those hats. That's not their training. Use them for what they're for. So tell us, like, what does the pilot program consist of? The program consists of triage pods that are made up of a social worker, an emergency communications dispatcher, and a paramedic. Now, the goal of these pods is to reduce police involvement and respond to mental health and drug addiction issues on a socially responsible manner. Now, we've covered a variety of instances, as you've said, Erica, of nationwide situations where police response to mental health and substance abuse crises results in the death of the people who the police are supposed to be responding to help. So reducing police interaction is the primary goal of the project. And these triage pods seem to bring together the necessary people to respond to these situations in a safe and responsible manner for the community. That sounds really great. Um, So you were talking about pods and it it sounds like they're exactly the people that you need in a mental health crisis. So can you tell us how the pods uh, are working? How was the program implemented? Data was collected throughout the month of June, 2021. In, In particular, 72 hours worth of service. The pod responded to an average of 56 incidences or about one every hour and 15 minutes of on-call service time. Now, 62.5% of those calls did not require police or fire department involvement. And 48% were completely resolved by the dispatcher or redirected to other community resources. So it has significantly reduced law enforcement interaction with these mental health and drug addiction situations. It's amazing that the numbers are so high. I mean, you said that this was gonna work. I just didn't know it was gonna work so well. That's amazing. Um, So do the program's results impact how it's received by law enforcement officers and the public? Well, Erica, you'll recall that these programs nationwide were inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement and the the other protests in in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Um, and the the variety of police-involved shootings and killings, the violent response to those protests that the police um, exhibited in 2020. Now, a lot of people call this sort of program defunding the police. But as I have said now for over a year, this is not defunding the police. It is refunding required necessary social services and removing police from medical response teams and allowing them to do what they're supposed to do, which is enforce laws. Now, as the data here shows, needs-based response saves lives and it frees up police to do what they are supposed to be doing, enforcing traffic laws, curbing violent crime, curbing human trafficking, curbing drug trafficking. 
Is it good to see that city officials will increase these hours of operation? Absolutely. Will this lead to additional triage and follow-up units? I sure hope so. And regardless of the politics surrounding the protests, what police want, what the thin blue line wants, what dispatchers, social workers, paramedics, firefighters, or anybody else who has skin in this game desire, what we see here is that there is a massive social benefit to investing in the mental health of the citizens of Columbus and that this program has worked in Columbus. It's worked in Portland. It's worked in Minneapolis. It's worked in Denver. It is working every single place that implements it time and time again. Reallocating these funds away from tanks and rocket launchers and into the hands of social workers and medical personnel is a good choice for our communities and it's a good choice for our country. I absolutely agree. And I, I'd love to start seeing that tagline on t-shirts and hats and and social media refund social programs because those results are amazing thank you so much for updating us on that progress absolutely and we love to see that success right here in our backyard a little bit further away erica did you see that the texas republican party is trying to make it harder for people to post bail by limiting the people who can help them do so? Um, I did. I didn't see. Like, we don't have bail where I'm from, <laughs> so these topics are always so interesting to me. So, uh, for me, I, like I just assume that um, a bail has to come from a bail bondsman. Is that true? It doesn't. A bail bondsman is only one option for posting the funds that a court requires to let you out of jail while your case proceeds through the criminal injustice system. A person that has the sufficient amount of cash or uh, they own property without any mortgages on it can post that uh, with the court to secure their release. There's no need for a, a third party intermediary. There's no need for somebody to come in between them. Additionally, nonprofits like the Bail Project have accepted applications and posted funds on behalf of people who have been accused of crimes. Now, the purpose of bail is to ensure the appearance of the accused. Hard stop. That's it. That's the purpose of bail. And it's been, it's been mutated and distorted into this manner of keeping people incarcerated in order to squeeze pleas out of the poorest people in our country and give the richest people in our country the ability to get out of jail and fight their cases from a position of freedom. So long as a person appears and moves through the system required by law, bail has worked. Bail will be released at the end of the, the case and now, in, in the case of these nonprofits, they get those monies back and can use the money to post bail for another person. The bail project in particular is available here in Ohio in both Cincinnati and Cleveland, as well as a variety of other places across the nation. And I would encourage everybody to go to the bailproject.org, bailproject.org, and donate to this wonderful cause. Uh, they are currently partnering with Little Nas X. He's a major funder of this project. Um, and they're doing great work to give people the opportunity to fight their cases rather than have to plead guilty just to get back to their families. So uh, let me ask, how exactly is this going to affect the person's ability to post Bail. How is it different from what's been happening? The proposed bill seeks to limit who can post bail for an arrestee. So in particular, what the Texas legislature is trying to do is cut out the ability of third parties to post bail on behalf of arrestees. Now, I, I find this incredibly ironic in especially in light of the capital insurrection and the nonprofit organizations who have come together uh, to post bail for their like and kind uh, to get them out of jail so that they didn't have to sit in federal detention uh, awaiting trial for uh, their acts of treason against the United States. 
Nevertheless, uh, the Texas GOP looks at this as an opportunity to cut out nonprofits like the Bail Project, to cut out Black churches from supporting members of their community, to cut out community resource centers who want to support people in the poorest of our nation's communities. They want to put a stranglehold on these accused people in order to squeeze out probation fees, fines, and court costs through guilty pleas to crimes that may never have been committed in the first place. This is going to, their, their goal is to keep people in custody pending trial which puts enormous pressure on the accused because of the ripple effect that custody has on the accused person's life. They lose their job, they lose their house, they lose their children, they lose their property. According to a, a whole plethora of studies, lower income people, those who are in poverty are grossly disaffected by cash bond. And perpetuating the idea that cash bond is necessary is a gross social injustice, and it must be stopped. It sounds just like something as absurd as hunting for witches in Salem and hanging people. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So what can we do to prevent this law from passing, if anything? Well, we're doing it right now, shining a light on this attempt at making the injustice system even more unjust is, is step one. So we want to bring this to the attention of the media. We want to discuss this among ourselves and our friends. You want to tell people what Texas is doing, because what Texas is doing is incrementally rolling back time to the 1950s, the 1920s, the 1850s. They want to move backwards in time while the rest of the country is moving forwards in time. And the problem is, is that they're only hurting themselves and their own citizens. Communicating your support for the termination of cash bail to local leaders to make sure that these uh, reforms continue to move forward. The elimination of cash bail is, is moved forward in your community through comments, letters to the editor, voting. It's critically important. The more the country moves away from cash bail, the more ostracized those states and localities are uh, that still require cash bail. Fortunately, Ohio is on the opposite trend, and Ohio is moving away from cash bail both through the legislature and through the Ohio Supreme Court, who has issued guidance requiring courts to revisit high cash bail amounts if the accused doesn't make that bond during the course of their case. So we've, we've got to fight back against this in every way that we possibly can. Um, you know, this is, this is nothing more than one more uh, attempt by uh, you know, the, the wealthy, the people in power, especially the GOP, to put their boot on the neck of the poor. And it's honestly disgusting. Um, it's a cash grab. Um, it's, it's a manner of encouraging people to plead guilty when they're not. And it, it's got to be stopped. Absolutely agree. And I'm glad we're shining a light on this because you know, you're right. It waiting around in jail for your uh, for your case to be heard can ruin your life and it will, you know you've mentioned at least five points um and and I'm sure there are many many more uh, there could be a whole show just on how waiting around in jail ruins your life so I'm glad that you're you're talking about this because I mean some of these people are are probably not even guilty and are going to get lesser, or they may not go to prison. So this whole thing with ruining their lives is for nothing. Right? That's absolutely accurate, Erica. And, and more practically, none of these people are guilty because none of these people have gone into court and admitted their guilt, entered a guilty plea. None of these people have been through a jury or a bench trial and been found guilty by a judge or a jury. Every single one of these people is innocent. We are incarcerating hundreds 
of thousands of innocent people at the cost of the taxpayers day in and day out in this country. We have the highest, by far, highest rate of incarceration of any developed nation. And <laughs> we are in the finest of company, such as places like North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, in incarcerating the highest number of our citizenry day in and day out here in the United States of America. It's a cry and shame and uh, it, it needs to be changed. And speaking of places that need drastic reform, Maricopa County, Arizona, Erica, back at it again, back in the news, stamping on people's constitutional rights, this time a sheriff's deputy posing as somebody's criminal defense attorney. Have you seen this, Erica? Oh my God. I mean, I know that would never happen to you <laughs> because nobody, there's only one Brian Jones, that is for sure. But, um, you know, that that is an amazing case. And I can't wait to hear you recall the, the details of this particular situation. <laughs> So the sheriff's deputy is trying to arrest the mother of a child who's represented by an attorney. He knows who the attorney is. He knows the firm that the attorney works for. So he calls her up and he pretends to be an attorney from this law firm. He says, I'm attorney Brown. I'm working for Freedom Law Firm and I'm your child's attorney. I need to meet with you. I need to interview your child about your case. Now, the mother grew suspicious and said, I don't think so. She called the firm and asked for attorney Brown and the firm said, that person doesn't exist. The firm then called the number back that the deputy had given her and confronted him about it. And he ultimately admitted his lies were an effort to arrest the mother. Wow. I mean, what? are they gonna do about this? Oh, Maricopa County in particular is a, a law enforcement cesspool. Uh, they have opened an internal investigation, but you know the, the, the place that rose Joe Arpaio to the highest levels of law enforcement um, is not surprisingly more than 2000 cases backlogged in their internal investigation department. The average case takes more than 500 days to complete investigation. That's almost two full years before uh, an internal affairs investigation is complete. Now the defense bar is rightly outraged and frankly concerned about the lawlessness of this deputy. Responsible police don't seem to be uh, worried about these allegations at all. And I, I think it's an embarrassment for our country. These people are sworn to uphold the constitution. Um, you know, they, they are allowed to lie, Erica, um, but you know, they are not allowed to do this. I mean, I know that we've actually done plenty of stories on how police officers are allowed to lie and especially when they're trying to get someone to admit to a crime, they they lie about their buddy in the next room, singing like a canary or you know whatever they say. Do canaries sing? Is it the canary? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I get get it right. Uh, but but this seems like definitely over the top. You're saying they're not allowed to pretend to be a an attorney. Um, are there any other professions that they're not allowed to pretend to be? Well, I don't think so. Um, the police are given great license to lie about the truth, to um, omit facts, to make up evidence during the course of their investigation and interaction with you and I. Police officers have absolutely zero obligation to be truthful, which should really tell you something about them and their profession. But attorneys are special. Attorneys are different. 
attorneys have to be licensed to do what they do. And the impersonation of a lawyer is the unauthorized practice of law. And in many jurisdictions, the unauthorized practice of law is not only a civil penalty, it is a crime in and of itself. The defense attorney plays a key and protected role in the criminal justice system. So impersonating one is particularly egregious. This isn't like pretending to be a 15-year-old on the internet, because nobody expects to trust a 15-year-old on the internet. You expect to be able to trust an attorney to, especially to trust your criminal defense attorney or the attorney that's been appointed to represent your child. And this officer has violated that trust in the most disgusting of manners. Uh, we are going to continue to follow this story uh, and, and find out when and if this monster's uppins will come. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, when you hire an attorney, <laughs> make sure that you not only see the piece of paper, when you talk to an attorney, make sure that you follow up and make sure you're talking to the right person if you're involved in a crime. I don't know if I told you that I recently did a will myself and I was looking for trying to figure out who was going to be my executor. And my attorney said that she is the executor for so many of her clients because that trust is there. And, you know, I believe that, that to be true. You it's almost like the good guys and the bad guys. It's the opposite of what you would, what you would think and what you, you hear from people, but you know, you're being held to a higher standard and it's amazing. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we trust attorneys to hold those documents that are only going to be revealed and executed after our deaths. If that isn't a position of trust, I don't know what is. Uh, and this officer has absolutely violated that, um, you know, broke social norms in the most egregious of ways. Um, and, and I, for one, hope he has significant consequences for doing so. And those are rights that are protected by the Fifth and Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution. And today, as promised, we're going to talk about the Sixth Amendment, which offers protection in all criminal prosecutions. In particular, that right is guaranteed through the right to a speedy and a public jury trial, a right to an impartial trial drawn from the jurisdiction, the geography where the allegation comes about, the right to be informed about what you're being accused of, including the elements of the charge that makes up the accusation, to be confronted and to be able to ask questions of the witnesses who are going to testify against you, the right to subpoena people, to force them, to drag them against their will into court to testify on your behalf, right to have a lawyer, a trusted confidant to present your case. Collectively, these are known as the trial rights. And today we're going to take a look at one portion of those, the right to an impartial jury drawn from the local population where the crime allegedly happened. I love when we have an opportunity for you to bring us back in time to when they were writing the constitution and, and talk about their reasons. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, why is the right to a jury trial important? Uh, why was it important to the framers of the constitution? Let's get on our way back machine. We're going to go back to 1776, 1778, 1780, 1787, when the Constitution, when, when the United States, when the colonists revolted against the king. And we're going to look at all of the things that the king, one of the things that the king was doing to try and oppress those colonists. Now, the framers who had lived through King George's oppression, who had lived through the revolution, who had tried and unfortunately failed in their first attempt to put together a government. They wanted to eliminate the use of judges and officers of the government as the determiners of the facts, the truth of the accusations of the government. Now, this system had been greatly used and abused by England, both in the United Kingdom and in all of their 
um, imperial colonies around the world, particularly in North America. The guarantee of a right to a jury is just a small portion of the guarantee of, of due process, of an opportunity to be heard and the opportunity to have your version, your defense, your story decided on its merits rather than the political whim of the trier of fact, the person who's deciding whether it's truthful or not. Now, a jury has always been dependent on the nature of the ifs. So what the standard is, is that you have to be exposed to jail time. You have to have the possibility of losing your freedom before you're entitled to a jury trial. Now, over time, the Supreme Court has shaped both the composition and the uh, outcome of juries, what, what they're required to do um, as a group. So juries have to be at least six people. They decided that uh, recently. And then more recently in Ramos versus Louisiana, the Supreme Court said both federal and state juries have to reach unanimous verdicts. They have to all agree on the verdict. You can't have a you can't have a 12-4 guilty verdict. You can't have a 12-4 not guilty verdict either for what it's worth. So this was critically important because time and time again, what the Crown would do is they would find somebody that they found to be unsavory for whatever reason. They'd make an accusation. They'd appoint all the people who already didn't like that person as the jury. And then they'd put them on trial, convict them and execute them. There was a foregone conclusion. So this is why the right to a jury trial was so important because what the Crown would do is they would say, well, you're, you're a criminal. We're going to put you on trial. We're going to appoint a magistrate. The magistrate's going to be beholden to the Crown. Magistrate finds you guilty and now you're executed. That sounds horrible. That sounds like just everything that happens in other countries that are not here. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just such a huge social injustice. It's hard to even think of that happening here at all. And I, and I know that there are times when there are ways to get around it and that it still does happen, even though we have laws preventing this. So maybe, can you explain a little bit more about the right to specify an impartial jury Absolutely, Erica. So impartiality is interpreted as meaning a lack of bias and therefore is, is the reason that we voir dire, why we ask questions of the panel, what's known as the veneer. So like the, the huge group of, of jurors that come into court and from that, uh, a, a smaller number is selected. Um, there's, a, there's the ability to challenge, to eliminate jurors um, based on their biases and whether that's an expressed bias and they are not able constitutionally, so a challenge for cause, they are not able to decide this particular case or whether that's a peremptory challenge, a challenge for any lawful reason. You, know, you can't challenge somebody based on their race, their sex, but you can challenge them because they live in a certain community or uh, you can challenge them because they looked at me with squinty eyes. Uh, you can challenge them because they were wearing a blue shirt. You know, whatever reason you want to eliminate that person from the jury, you can't. Now, those challenges are limited in number and you have to use them with discretion, but they are available. Voir dire is the application of this protection, this ability to seat an impartial jury. And really, in my opinion, it is the most critical stage of a jury trial. You know, for a long time, really, since I can remember being a lawyer, I have always said that trials are won and lost in voir dire and opening statement. Once opening statement is concluded, if you come through with the promises that you have made during voir dire and opening statement, if you can present that evidence, you're gonna win your case. 
So identifying bias is not only the duty of the lawyers, but also the duty of the court. And it can be the claim of an ineffective assistance of counsel allegation or prosecutorial misconduct. The protection against a biased jury looks back to the experience in England when juries were packed with the supporters of the crown. And in America, the ability to have an impartial and unbiased jury is, is a critical aspect of the Sixth Amendment. Your job is so difficult because now there's social media, there's newspapers, there, there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of information out there that make it incredibly difficult to find an unbiased person to serve on the jury. So that is why it is so important to have a skilled attorney that really understands this and knows what questions to ask, knows what to look for when they are trying to whittle down that jury and, and pick the people that are going to be on there. Um, I mean, over the years, you must have a checklist of things to look for, I would imagine. No, no, I don't. Um, when I voir dire a jury, I am building relationships. So I guess I do have a checklist, but that checklist only has one item on it. Um, I don't have a connection to that person. I've left nurses on juries that involve medical issues. I've left teachers on juries that um, have child accusers. I've left law enforcement on juries of uh, drug trafficking cases and won every single one of those cases because I had a connection to that person. I've excluded, I have removed peremptorily you know, not for cause, um, people who have been falsely accused by the police um, because that person didn't mesh with the rest of my jury. So what I'm looking for is to build a tribe, a group of people that will come together um, and have an emotional connection, not just to one another in the box, but with me as well. I love that. Can I quote you on that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that is so beautifully said. You're, you're looking to build that connection and to build a tribe. And that makes so much sense because the more trust you build and the, you know, with, those people, the more likely what you say is going to get through to them and it it's more believable. I mean, even though what you're saying is the truth, you know, they, it's just all comes down to who they're going to believe you or the prosecution. So, I mean, again, I'd like to encourage everyone out there that they themselves or someone they know has a criminal matter. If you are in the Ohio area, give the law offices of Brian Jones a call. You won't be sorry. They're absolutely amazing. Um, so can you tell us, uh, you know, why is it important that the jury be made of people from the place where the crime was committed? Well, I think the, the best way I can explain that, Erica, is by telling you about the can opener. Now, you've seen a can opener, right, Erica? Yeah, I just used one yesterday. But have you seen the can opener? Do you know what the can opener is? And the, the answer is no. You don't know what the can opener is because it's unique to our area. The can opener is a train trestle that is, I believe it's 10 and a half, maybe 11 feet over the ground. And time and time again, despite numerous warnings, uh, semi-trucks will try and go underneath the can opener. And you can imagine why it's called the can opener, because the back end, the, the trailer of the truck will get ripped open like a can of sardines. And it gets stuck and it's a whole thing and it clogs up traffic in town. Now, why do we need, why, why is this important to a jury from the place where the crime is committed? Well, because in, in a jury trial in 
Delaware, Ohio, people are going to talk about the can opener if it's relevant. People are going to say the can opener and everybody's going to understand what the can opener is. Likewise, it's important for the social norms of that community to be a factor in the outcome of the case. There are some jurisdictions that are more conservative. There are some jurisdictions that are more liberal. And people should be judged by the standards of the community that they live in. You know, the law is not a static, inanimate object. The law is truly alive and it is malleable. It is moldable to the social standards of the place that it's being applied. The jury is listening to two competing versions of events and they use their own perception and interpretation of those events to decide what the truth is. And for that reason alone, you want a fair cross-section of the population. But more importantly, as we've discussed, you need people from the local area to be called in for the selection process. The, the ability of the jury to understand the context of the community is critically important. And it creates more fair outcomes because we're not holding somebody from rural America to the standard of urban America. We're holding rural to rural and urban to urban. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I, you get those local, uh, those local phrases. I know you set me up there <laughs> to prove your point. And that just goes to show what a great attorney you are. Um, but yeah, and also they got to care about what's going on in their community, I would think, and what's happening to the people in their community. Um, so, I mean, it, yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you put it that way. Um, absolutely, Erica. Okay. It's, it's critically important that the jury have some stake in the game. And not only, you know, and, and, and a lot of people think, well, gosh, you know, they they're from the community, they're gonna want their community to be safe, they're gonna want their community to be crime free. But likewise, it's not just that person sitting over at the defense table that could be a danger to them in their community. It's that lying cop that gets on the witness stand. It's that dishonest prosecutor sitting over at the government's table that could point their finger at them next. And that's why voir dire is so critically important is, finding people that understand that and putting them in your jury. Yeah, that that's a really good point. I mean, you don't wanna be treated badly. You don't wanna see people treated unfairly because you and your family and your friends and your colleagues, you, they're all at risk later on if you let that continue in your community. That's absolutely correct. Well, Erica, thank you. I appreciate you engaging in this discussion with me today. And to everybody out there listening, thank you for listening to our show this week. Make sure that you stay informed about amazing programs like Columbus's Alternative Response Pilot Program. Make sure that you stay informed about the fight for bail reform, the fight against lying cops, holding the government accountable, and staying informed about all of your constitutional and civil rights right here with the law office of brianjones.com on the Suri Generous Show, on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Central Ohio Criminal Defense, on our TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter pages at T-L-O-B-J. And we'll be back next week with a Suri Generous perspective on the big news events in civil rights and the criminal injustice system, as well as a deep dive into the age old question, why? If the officer found drugs in my car, didn't he arrest me? Erica, my grandfather always told me when we parted ways, hey kid, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And to that, when I part ways with my friends, I add, if you do and you get caught, call me. I'll defend your rights as I'd want mine defended. 